Welcome to Substantial Authorities, a tax podcast brought to you by the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law Tax Program, recognized as a leader in its field, ranked in the top four annually every year since 2005, preparing students for careers in federal, state, and international tax law. Substantial Authorities, the tax podcast, brings to you conversations with leading tax figures on matters relating to tax administration, tax controversy, and tax litigation. I'm your host, Matt Frank. Welcome to the conversation. Hello and welcome to Substantial Authorities, the tax podcast. I'm Matt Frank, a partner at the law firm Steptoe & Johnson LLP. This is our inaugural episode, and I'm honored to have as our first guest, Albert Lauber, Senior Judge, U.S. Tax Court. By way of introduction for the audience, I'll just run quickly through some of the milestones in the judge's professional career, leaving aside the awards and accolades he's earned. Uh, he graduated Xavier High School in Manhattan in 1967, then went to Yale College where he studied English literature and philosophy. After college, he went to Clare College at the University of Cambridge and studied classics for three years before returning to Yale for law school. He graduated law school in 1977 and clerked first for Malcolm Wilkie on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit and then for Justice Blackmun on the U.S. Supreme Court during the 78-79 <coughs> term. For the 30-plus years following that, he worked principally at the law firm Kaplan and Drysdale in Washington, D.C., and at the U.S. Solicitor General's Office from 1983 to 1988, first as the tax assistant to the Solicitor General, then as a deputy Solicitor General. Later, he went to Georgetown University Law Center, where, until becoming a tax court judge, he was in charge of the graduate tax program. Judge Lauber was nominated by President Obama to the U.S. Tax Court in May 2011, and one and a half years later was confirmed by the Senate in January 2013. Judge Lauber is eight and a half years into his 15-year term. In January 2020, he assumed senior status. Judge Lauber has been and continues to be an extraordinarily productive judge. For the benefit of the audience, I'm going to put on the screen a pie chart the chart is based on the number of opinions issued by the 20 most productive tax court judges over the five-year period ending June 30, 2021. It shows, with respect to the 20 most productive judges, Judge Lauber accounted for 13% of their output. We'll come back to that a bit later. Some of the judges' most notable opinions, but by no means all, are shown here, beginning with the recently decided Coca-Cola case. I'll tell the audience now, uh, perhaps to its disappointment, but not to its surprise, we will not be talking about the pending cases before the judge. So again, thank you, Judge, for uh, agreeing to appear. Thank you for having me, as I say it, on Rachel's show. <laughs> At the Senate confirmation, you said you've always wanted to be a judge. Now, some people try to position themselves to make that more likely. Did you do anything? How did it come about? I think it's very hard to um, <clears throat> plan for that. Uh, particularly for someone like me who lived in the District of Columbia and has no senator. I wasn't particularly active in ABA activities. So um, I was not on anybody's short list. And it was, a, it was really just an act of God, really. I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, a lovely woman named Diana Beinart, who had worked at Kaplan and Drysdale with me, um, worked for the Obama campaign, wound up in the White House. And she was on the... Um, vetting team for, for vetting nominees who'd already been selected. But somebody from the nominating team came over to her and said, you know about tax, right? So we got this list of people for the tax court. We don't like any of them. Do you want anybody who might be interested? You said, oh, yeah, I, I think I do. So she called me up. And 18 months later, <laughs> I got, I got uh, confirmed. What was the nomination process like? Well, you know, for tax court judges, it's different for other judges because we go to the finance committee, not the um, judiciary committee. And finance, I think to its credit, has a, a practice of doing a lot of the vetting stuff behind closed doors in preliminary meetings. So the actual confirmation hearing is, well, not exactly a coronation, but it, 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 it's kind of a cakewalk. Every, every, all the stuff has been done. All the problems have been discussed and vetted and cleared away. Judiciary is, you know, you get killed with negative, hostile questions and stuff. 
So funny, I, I liked the process very much. I, I must say I found the, um, the, the staff and the, uh, the, the senators on both sides of the aisle very um, p polite and easy, easy to deal with. The main problem was the, the slow pace and the delay. And uh, part of the problem was after they interviewed me for the tax court, uh, I was also interviewed to be uh, head of the tax division at the Justice Department and to be assistant secretary for tax policy at Treasury, which is a position that had just become vacant. And those sets of interviews took you know, up a lot of time. And I eventually decided that um, the, the kind of the long-term tenure appealed to me uh, of the tax court job. And plus, I knew nothing about tax policy or <laughs> the, the Hill. So I didn't think I was right for the Treasury job, and they agreed with me. But that put, kicked it into an election year. And once it gets into an election year, everything stops. And uh, uh, eventually, I got confirmed along with was Ron Book, who was kind of, we were kind of tied at the hip throughout this process, uh, at 6 p.m. on New Year's Day of 2013. It was only because the session had been extended because it was a government shutdown, they had to get a budget through, that, uh, you know, we got confirmed at all. Did you ever give up hope? Oh, yeah, often. It was frustrating, but that's politics. At the confirmation hearing, Chairman Baucus asked you what you wanted to accomplish as a judge, and that was your opportunity, which you did not take, to talk about shaping tax law or bettering mankind. Instead, <laughs> you said, I want to be reversed as little as possible. That was, I mean, that sounds modest or even self-effacing to some. Well, I, you know, I don't think it's the judge's job to be making tax policy or other branches of government that, that do that. And our, our job is to take each case as it comes and try and decide it correctly. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, when I draft an opinion, I, I, I try and reach the, what I think is the correct result. And I try and write a persuasive um, piece of text to justify my result. And, you know, hopefully if, if uh, I've done both of those things well, I will not be reversed. And uh, occasionally you have issues where a, a tax, technician, tax technician may think that the answer is X, but a panel of leg judges who don't know about tax and take a higher level view of the world disagree. And uh, the, the cases which I've been reversed, I think there have been three of them, have been cases like that, where, where I took a very tax technical kind of viewpoint that you know, some lay people may have thought was uh, resulted in a bad outcome for the taxpayer. And uh, I got reversed three times. Let's go back to the beginning. So you were at Clare College studying classics, and you decided to go to law school. When did you decide that, and why? Why law school? <clears throat> well, it was a complete uh, change of course. So uh, well, I was in England during the uh, horrible early 70s when we had stagflation and uh, economic mess and the Arab oil embargo and all the rest of it. And I, I, my plan had been to come back to the U.S. and get a Ph.D. and teach um, English literature. And my, my reason for going to Cambridge to do Latin and Greek was to study the kind of classical prototypes, you know, Virgil, Horace, Homer, that influenced writers in the 17th, 18th centuries. And I thought it would be useful to know the classical models they were working off of and revising. By 1973, all my friends in PhD programs like driving taxi cabs in Saskatchewan, so I figured, no, I, a PhD is not the right thing. So I, I stayed at Cambridge actually a third year beyond the original scholarship and uh, took the law, LSATs and decided to go to law school. So it was just, I just bailed out, basically. You know, I, I had no grand plan to be a lawyer at any point in my life. It just was sort of desperation economically. Did you enjoy law school? Yeah, I think for someone like with my bent, Yale was a pretty good place to go. It, 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 uh, there are a lot of PhD manque there, you know. It, it has a lot of social policy focus. And, uh, you know, I, I felt kind of it, like it was less of a rat race maybe than a, a, a large school with 500 people in the class would have been. Um, 
the, the downside about Yale was that it, it really is a graduate school of social policy, you know, rather than a, what you what I had thought of a law school would be. And after spending three years at Cambridge, you know, carefully parsing Latin and Greek texts where you have to get every word right or you completely miss the meaning of the of this of the sentence. And I thought law school would be kinda of like that, like looking at statues and and it was all about the cost of accidents and who should bear the costs and are we the criminals or are they the criminals and you know, I I, I so I kind of retreated to tax and bankruptcy as these kind of two code based courses where the text was very uh, prominent. And you, it wasn't like what you could get five judges to vote for you know, on a given day. It, it was, you had to deal with the text. And I think that's why I was drawn to tax. That and um, liking math, I mean, basic math. I don't do four-dimensional space very well, but I, was, I liked geometry and uh, <clears throat> algebra, and I, liked, I like having things tie up. You know what I mean? I like balancing my checkbook. Probably one of the few people left in the world who still balances his checkbook. And I just like having it all debits and credits all add up. And I think that mindset is helpful for tax. So following graduation, you clerked first for Judge Wilkie on the District of Columbia, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and then for Justice Blackman, both appellate court experiences. How did those compare? Well, they're different in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, Judge Blackman, Justice Blackman uh, had a career background in tax. He, he, was, he was a tax lawyer. He was general counsel to Mayo Clinic for eight years before he went on to the Eighth Circuit. So he tended to get a lot of assignments in tax cases. Chief Justice Berger especially liked to give him tax cases. So uh, one advantage of that was I got to write opinions in some tax cases. Um, D.C. Circuit was very different. It was all administrative law, you know, EPA cases and FERC cases and big um, <clears throat> FCC cases. And you know, I found them a little less attractive. Just the records were so humongous, and I didn't find the subject matter that terribly interesting. Um, another difference was Judge Wilkie was a very, uh, very certain of his views. I mean, he he had been a U.S. attorney in Houston. He had head of the criminal division at Maine Justice, and he, he he kind of knew what he thought the answer was. And the result was he never required. Um, bench memos from us on pending cases. He, he would read the briefs and decide what the, what the right answer was. And we, 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 we would just write, write the opinion. Um, so it was, a, it was a, a less heavy workload. Just as Blackman was just the opposite. He wanted, he wanted a memo on everything. If there was some prisoner in Arkansas State Prison who was, had filed his 98th habeas corpus petition and sent it to Blackman, he wanted a memo on that. And so, you know, that was much more of a 12-hour a day, seven-day-a-week job. Um, but, but they were both very enjoyable, you know. Any lessons you draw from that experience in retrospect? I think that, well, I, I would probably say I tend to be more like Judge Wilkie in that when I have a case and I've tried it, I have a pretty clear view about how I think it ought to come out, at least how the facts ought to be, you know, sized up. And uh, just as Blackman w w was much more open to persuasion from his clerks, I think. I mean, he, on most cases, he could go either way. I mean, as time went on, he formed definite views in areas like abortion and other uh, death penalty <clears throat> ultimately. But on the general run of cases, he was pretty much, uh, you know, he, he, he was fairly open to his clerk's suggestions, and Judge Wilkie was not that. And I guess I'm, in that respect, I think I resemble Judge Wilkie more in that I, I'm always willing to be corrected, you know, but I tend to have fairly strong views to put them on paper uh, uh, as a basis for going forward. Let me ask you, was it a coincidence that you ended up with Justice Blackman, or did your interest in tax somehow make that more likely than another justice? I think it was, again, um, <laughs> one of those luck of the draw things. Uh, you know, I applied to all the justices, as most people do. And um, because Judd Wilkie was a Republican, he was more of a feeder, to the extent he was a feeder to the you know, Republican appointed. Uh, 
justice is. And uh, I think that what helped me with Justice Blackman was that a, a clerk, one of his clerks for, for the year I was applying, the, the year ahead, uh, ahead of me, uh, Ruth Glushen, a clerk for had had uh, was the uh, the executive editor of the Yale Law Journal. So when I wrote for her, you know, she, we got to know each other very well, and I think she kind of put in a good word for me in Blackman's chambers and got me on the short list. So I'm asking about a case in your persuasion, since you said Justice Blackman was open to persuasion. Thor Power Tool was decided during the term, the 78-79 term, when you were just uh, clerking for Justice Blackman, and he wrote the opinion for a unanimous court. In that case, uh, the court held that the commissioner has wide discretion under Code Sections 446 and 471. Well, he does. Read, 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 the, read the language. <laughs> so more than 40 years have passed. Uh, what, what, what can you tell us about your, your involvement in that? Any stories? Well, I did... I did prepare a draft opinion for um, Justice Blackman in that case. It was an interesting case. So there was no circuit conflict on this question. It was a question of inventory accounting. And what the issue was, was the taxpayer had written down what it believed was its excess inventory on the theory it would never sell that stuff. But it didn't throw it away. It kept it around just in case it needed it. And it, it, and it took down took a write-down for gap accounting, and the, it's a CPA signed off on that. And they took the same loss for federal tax purposes. The question was whether this loss was uh, uh, appropriate. And there was no circuit conflict on the question, and it was a taxpayer appeal, and there were four votes to grant. And normally when there were four votes to grant without a conflict, that suggests there's some interest in maybe reversing the uh, the, the, the Court of Appeals. Um, but when we actually got the case, uh, it turned out it was pretty open and shut. I, I think what happened was some of the kind of pro-business justices, like maybe Powell, Stewart, were very convinced by an amicus brief that had been filed at the cert stage, I think by the Chamber of Commerce, a bunch of other business groups who kind of said it's really important that we respect gap accounting for tax purposes and keep it all uniform, and, and they found that kind of persuasive. But when we actually got into the law, looked at the regulations, the code and regulations on this, it's pretty cut and dried that, that uh, gap accounting does not govern the tax outcome. And there was a, an amicus brief filed on the, on the government side by a, a couple of law professors uh, making that point very forcefully, which I found uh, quite persuasive. So on amicus briefs, th there have been some recent transfer pricing <clears throat> cases in which there have been a lot of amicus brief or amicus interest. Uh, what's been your experience as a judge in terms of the, the value of an amicus brief? When do they have value? So I, I find that the amicus briefs are, are least valuable where they're just me too briefs. When <clears throat> somebody from the same industry files a brief and says, yeah, I agree with the taxpayer. I mean, you know, that has very little little value. I would say the most persuasive briefs often are filed by, by uh, law professors or other people who don't have a financial interest or ax to grind uh, in, in terms of the outcome. For example, the brief in, the, in Thor Power Tool on the merits that I found persuasive was, was <clears throat> You know, filed by uh, Calvin Johnson, another law professor, and it, on the government side, it made the point that gap accounting is a lot more loosey goosey and flexible than people think. And you know, they quoted somebody saying, uh, "Gap accounting means somebody got away with it." You know, and, and that, that you can't have that sort of standard <clears throat> for <clears throat> taking. Uh, deductions and losses for federal tax purposes. And so one of the main points we made in the draft was that, you know, financial accounting and tax accounting are very different purposes. I mean, financial accounting is designed to protect shareholders and bondholders, you know, from uh, uh, being misled. And so understatement of income for the corporation is kind of a goal, whereas understatement of income is not a prime goal for tax accounting. <clears throat> and uh, I think that that point persuaded several justices who'd voted to grant social rare right to uh, sign on to the opinion to make it unanimous eventually. 
<clears throat> Did the Supreme Court take more tax cases back in that day than they are now? Oh, yeah. If you go back to the 30s and 40s and 50s, they took dozens and dozens of tax cases. I mean, part, you know, the tax tax law was not as old then. More things were new and undecided. Uh, But I think it's more, way back then, you know, they would take 170 cases a year, and they would take cases just because they were important. They thought they were important to the economy or to society, to businesses, whatever. And they would help dispel uncertainty. And... It, they did not insist on a circuit con- on a strict literal circuit conflict in order to take tax cases. Over time, I mean, now they take what one tax case every third year, maybe, um, and I think it's because circuit. And they ignore conflicts often now, uh, and I don't know why it is they think that the sixty-five cases is enough for <laughs> nine justices, each of whom has four law clerks. I don't understand why their their caseload ha- has shrunk. So much. It, it, it's, I think it's a notion that the the court should do less rather than more, and I think you know, 50 years ago, the court thought they should do more rather than less. In your confirmation hearing, a question was put to you in, about what part of the Internal Revenue Code you might change if you had the power, the emperor's pen. <clears throat> are, are there issues now in lower courts that you wish most the Supreme Court would take and address? Well, one, uh, I, I'm sort of conflicted on this question, but one, one area where there's an awful lot of litigation now involves the validity of Treasury regulations. And, you know, 30 years ago, it was very rare to challenge a Treasury regulation. I mean, lawyers just didn't think it passed a straight face test to do that very often. You very rarely saw challenges to regulations. Now, they're all over the place. <clears throat> and part of the reason, I think, is uh, rumors emanating from the Supreme Court and from concurring opinions and dissenting opinions that they might be uh, uh, up for overruling Chevron case and Mont Mayo, which applied Chevron principles to tax regulations. And so a lot of lawyers think it would like be malpractice not to challenge regs to get that challenge on the books in case the court were to overrule Chevron. And uh, so we're, everybody's kind of just hanging, waiting to see whether that happens or not. And it, 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 th- that status has encouraged an awful lot. I mean, I've written, I don't know, the last five opinions I've written have involved a reg challenge. So that, that there's a lot of uncertainty right now uh, in the tax world about the status of regulations and how to go about uh, considering challenges to their validity. And, uh, you know, I, I, so we're waiting to see what happens on that. You spent five years at the Solicitor General's office. How, how did that come about? What was that experience? It was like? another, you know, phone call that was an act of God. Uh, I was working at Kaplan and Drysdale on some case, and uh, I got a phone call from <clears throat> Richard Willard, who was a head clerk for Blackman about four or five years before me, and he was then the head of the civil division at Justice. And the position of tax assistant to the SG had was about to become um, vacant, and he asked me if I'd be interested, and I said I would, and I went over and interviewed with Rex Lee and a few other people, and uh, got the job. Again, it was just a phone call. It just, you know, I, did, I didn't, I never thought of working there, frankly. It just uh, happened. So you're the only tax assistant to the SGI I know. The position you just said preceded you, <laughs> did it follow you? It, it, it was, um, the SGI's office has, I don't know, like 19 lawyers, something like that. And <clears throat> there's always one, there had been, traditionally, this one position, which was this, an senior executive service, SES position, like the deputy positions uh, for the tax assistant. And the theory was tax is so weird and difficult and complicated. You need to have somebody doing that full time rather than doing an EPA case one day and a criminal case the next day and a tax case the next day. So you need to have a specialist in that position. 
And uh, I had the job, and it existed for quite a few years before me. There's a, a partner at your firm, Matthew Zinn, who was a tax assistant about 30 years before me, whom I got to know very well. And I think it, it, it survived for several years after I was there. But then as the volume of tax cases went down so much, as people were, as it was, like here we one tax case every third year, they decided they didn't really need it, a dedicated position just for tax. So the, the other tax cases are rotated among all the assistants. So, but you moved from tax assistant to deputy AG, uh, SG. Why was that? Well, <laughs> that was, it was a lot of maybe politics involved in that. You may remember, Ed Meese was not the most popular attorney general in certain circles, and he ruffled quite a few feathers. And there, at one point, was a, you might call it a mass exodus of top people from the SG's office. Um, Ken Geller, uh, Andy Fry, who were both deputies, and a couple of assistants all left together en masse and, and um, joined a law firm. And because of that, and because Morale was generally kind of bad <clears throat> in the SG's office at that time. The Assistant General, who was in Charles Freed, thought it was important to promote somebody from within to kind of you know, make people feel that you know, their concerns were taken seriously. And I think I was fairly well liked you know, among the assistants. And I think that was the main reason. I mean, I was not the obvious person to pick because I was a tax guy. I mean, I, I kept the tax division when I was a deputy as part of my, but I also got the civil division. I knew nothing about, you know, government contracting or <laughs> personnel actions or anything. So I was not the most perfect person for the job, but I think it was important, Chick Charles thought it was important to um, have someone from within be brought. And I had done quite a bit of work outside of tax in sort of sensitive cases. There was a an affirmative action case involving um, that had been kicking around on remands, the court of appeals, up and back from the Supreme Court for like a decade. And Paul Bator, who was the um, political deputy, asked me to help work on that case because we had changed, the government had changed its position. <laughs> and whenever they do that, they feel very obligated to explain to the court why in a respectful, persuasive way. So I worked on that one, and then I worked on another big busing case. And I think it was in outside St. Louis. So even though I was a tax guy, I had done some work on general, um, mostly civil rights type cases. I, you know, I, I also had been asked to work on the first brief in which um, the government argued that Roe v. Wade should be overruled. Charles asked me to work on that, and I said I would do that but I would not write that part of the, of the brief. I would write the part urging that the Court of Appeals should be um, reversed under existing law. And then he wrote the last 10 pages and said, candidly, we think you need to do more than that. Um, and I took a lot of flack from Blackman alumni for, I, didn't, I, took, I did not put my name on the brief, but it word got out. And, uh, Justice Marshall is alleged to have said what he got to be said. There's no assistant's name on the brief. Who wrote this thing? And uh, so people found out. <clears throat> and I got a lot of flack. And I think, frankly, I think my relationship with Justice Blackman suffered because of that. He, he took such ownership, you know, of Roe v. Wade. Anyhow, so the long and short of it is, uh, even as a tax person, I had done a fair bit of work on sensitive cases. And I think Charles thought that indicated I'd be able to you know, handle the deputy deputy job. Did, did that experience tempt you to broaden your scope beyond tax or reconfirm your commitment to tax? It kind of reconfirmed my commitment to tax. Um, I just feel so much more comfortable with, you know, the, these two volumes of the code and these six volumes of the regs. Well, now it's four. They've shrunk. They make them big, the bigger pages. It's kind of my security blanket. You know, I feel that there's an answer in there somewhere, most likely, unless you have some doctrine overruling it. And I, I just find that to be um, like a life preserver kind of 
in a sea of uncertainty. <clears throat> you argued 15 cases. You won 12. Uh, you said a few years ago you don't miss Supreme Court arguments because they were so stressful you could never prepare enough. If you listen to your oral arguments, which, by the way, are available on the Internet, after the first one, the first one is an exception. After the first one, you sound very comfortable. Uh, did you get more comfortable over time? What lessons did you draw from that experience? Well, I think I got more comfortable in the, in the space you know, talk, and I, I, got, I finally got to the point where I could just talk to them like I'm talking to you now. And actually, you know, you can. You're not that far away. The, the podium is very close to the, to, the, to the bench. And you can look them in the eye and see all their, you know, facial gestures and stuff. When I finally got over the stage fright part, uh, I, I was able to just kind of have a conversation. And that was better. But I still found the preparation process to be very, very stressful because... When you write a brief, you kind of know when you're finished. You may go through multiple drafts, but, you, but finally you get to the point where, yeah, this is, this is done. File it. Maybe I'll do a reply, reply brief later. Or argument, you never know when you're done. And you know, there's always, you worry about some arcane tax provision that you hadn't thought of that some law clerk may come up with and feed you know, a question to the justice about. You, you, and there's also, because of the time pressure, there's such a premium placed on not only get, giving a, a good answer, but giving an extremely succinct answer so you can get past the question and move back to your argument. What you don't want to do is kind of <clears throat> flail around for a while and blow five minutes on a question. And again, you almost have to anticipate questions and form responses you can memorize and sort of spit out mm -hmm. and get back to your, get back to your point. And all that I just found very stressful. I much prefer putting my thoughts in writing and taking the time I need, and then I'm done. In your confirmation hearing, you said you're a textualist, and you repeated that in subsequent interviews. <clears throat> but Justice Kagan said in 2015, we're all textualists <laughs> now, which makes you wonder what the word means or if it means <laughs> anything. What does it mean to you, and what does that mean for litigants appearing before you? Well, I think Justice Kagan is right. Uh, <laughs> now, any, any judge who's connected to the real world, if you have a case about statutory construction, you start with the statute and you pay a lot of attention to the statute, the words of the statute, the context of the provision, how words in that provision are used elsewhere in the same law, you know, that kind of thing. And that's clearly a good thing. I mean, the, the, I think there were some Supreme Court cases from the 60s and 70s that jumped kind of to policy and, you know, what Congress's intent. And Congress intended the good policy, and good policy would be like this, so that's how we could construe the statute. And those cases were, you know, often not as well tightly reasoned as they should have been. So I think it's good that there was a reaction against that. And you really do have to start with the statute. The question is whether you end with the statute. And that, that's where I part company with like what I call the radical textualist, like Justice Scalia became toward the end of his career, who said legislative history is irrelevant. And you know, to me, that just sounds crazy. I mean, nobody in Congress reads the actual bill. If we, if we read, look at the bill. It says Section 14,220. Uh, and then code section 8520 by adding a new subsection Q. H how do you know what that means? So even if you had read the bill, which nobody does, it, it would be unintelligible to you. The way members know what's in the thing they're voting on is they read the report. They read the conference report, the House and Senate reports. And to dismiss them as irrelevant because they're not the thing that Congress passed and the president put his signature on, I think is just crazy. I, I don't understand that level of, <clears throat> of, um, of literalism. Now, now again, you, you, you really only, in most cases, what I'll be using length of history for is to confirm my textual reading of the, of the statute. See, it's supported by legislative history. I don't think you can very well countermand the text by saying, well, they wrote that, but yeah, this is not what they intended. You know, I would not 
write an opinion like that. Well, that, that, that's the problem, right? I mean, legislative history, frankly, isn't what it used to be. There used to be that's more. That's true. And even at its best, yeah. it didn't address all the, right. all the intricacies. <clears throat> so you, you've got, I mean, you, you say you, you don't sort of countermand the text because you don't think it's good policy. On the other hand, you may come to the conclusion that this, it's just weird that the text would lead you to a place mm -hmm. and you have trouble thinking that the legislator intended it for, if, if it had even thought of it, mm -hmm. it, that it intended it. Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I think the scenario you're positing where you have <clears throat> the text taking you to a, a uh, very anomalous position and legislative history that maybe c countermands that, that's a very unusual scenario. But it does come up occasionally, and I had a case a couple of years ago called Borenstein, which presented exactly the problem that you're raising. And it involved the <clears throat> limitations period within which we could uh, find a, an overpayment and order a refund to a taxpayer. And the code has a, lim a period under which the return must have been filed for, for the court to be able to do that. And it's jurisdictional, basically. And Congress had amended that provision to overrule a Supreme Court decision in uh, the government's favor to afford a more liberal filing period for taxpayers in order to be able to get a refund in our court. But they, it was a terribly drafted statute. And while it kind of solved the problem they tried to solve for most taxpayers, the case I had presented this weird situation where this woman had um, paid a bunch of tax by the April 15th. It requested an extension of time to file the return, but she failed to file the return by the extended due date. And given this odd concatenation of facts, her <laughs> case fell into what her lawyers, I think, brilliantly called a black hole in our jurisdiction. So read literally, we had jurisdiction to order a refund if she had filed her claim within, return within this like three, three plus year period. Then there was a six month gap when we wouldn't have jurisdiction. Then it would pick up again <laughs> and we would have jurisdiction. And this was pretty anomalous, <clears throat> no question about it. But, but both my law clerks thought we should rule for the taxpayer because they thought this was just a, a, a ridiculous outcome. But I wrestled with this text and applied normal rules of English grammar and syntax and ordinary rules of statutory construction about you know what terms modify the nearer rather than a more distant uh, term. And I concluded that, that the government was right, that there was this hole. And then I had to decide whether is this rendered, is this absurd? Because I think most judges, including me, even if you're a, a pretty firm textualist, you, you, you will have an escape hatch if the construction you are adopting is absurd. And there's case law going back to 1900 on that in the Supreme Court. And I said, well, you know, it really isn't absurd. It produces an anomalous result on the peculiar facts of this taxpayer's case. But in the generality of cases, it solved the problem that Congress wanted to solve. It extended the filing period limitations period for most taxpayers. So what we have here is really a gap. I mean, it, it's an imperfect statute. It's not an absurd one, it's an imperfect statute that, l that left a gap into which this woman unfortunately fell. And the answer we usually give to that question is to Congress should fix the statute. Now, I admit I got reversed <clears throat> by the Second Circuit on that case and they found a way, the, the kind of critical thing was there was a phrase, time, time to file, with extensions, the question is what with extensions modified. And I said it modified the word immediately before it, phrased me. And the second circuit, well, no, I really modified something 22 words before it, and they were able to find a way to rule for her way by doing that kind of dance with the statute. And I understand that. I mean, they, they, they were, again, there was a panel of non-specialist judges. It illustrates a point you know, we were discussing earlier that I took what I thought was a tax technical uh, result, and then they took a more of a common sense, high level approach. And uh, you know, I didn't mind being reversed on that, on that one. Well, let, let, me ask, let me ask you, what, what you've just described is, I mean, you just described a situation in which applying the law literally 
created a hardship for a discrete population, but not havoc for mm. the system. Yeah, right. So, do, I mean, is the lesson you take that you'll be a textualist, you'll be a literalist, and force Congress to do a better job when the stakes are low, but you will offer a remedial interpretation if you think holding Congress to its words will create havoc? I think I, think I would put it that way. Um, I, mean, I do think courts have an obligation to consider the real world you know, consequences of their uh, opinions. But whether that would be enough if we thought they were dramatic to, to um, require us to ignore the meaning of a statute, I, again, I think it depends a lot on your role. I mean, I don't think that a trial judge should do that. You know, if the people upstairs <clears throat> want to take a different point of view, I think the trial judge, particularly on the tax court, owes <clears throat> the appellate court and the Supreme Court, you know, your best shot at what the technical right answer is. And if, if they think the consequences are too severe and we're going to have a third great recession, um, they, they, can, they can do what they think they need to do. But I think it's not really for the trial judge to anticipate all that and up front. So when you were nominated and confirmed to the tax court, is there a tax court school that they send judges to to learn how to become a judge? <clears throat> no, there's no school that we get sent to. I think there still is a kind of a school that um, all uh, confirmed judges can go to, and a lot of district court judges go to that, and it, they focus heavily on the rules of evidence and the, and the criminal procedure, which you know may not be second nature to uh, a lot of lawyers who get confirmed to trial judge positions on the district courts. In our court, you know, we don't have any juries. We don't have any criminal jurisdiction. And the rules of evidence are <clears throat> less, much, less often dispositive because virtually most things are stipulated, you know, in our court. So you don't, don't have hearsay problems the way you do otherwise. So, no, I, I think very few tax court judges um, go, go to that general judge school. But what we do is we have kind of on-the-job training where the newbie judge will accompany a more experienced judge to a trial session and uh, work with that judge ahead of time. Like if there are conference calls with the, the parties on the calendar, you'll take part, listen in on that. If there are motions pre-trial, you'll talk to the, the experienced judge about how they're going to be handled. You go out to the session. You sit in the audience for a couple of days, just observe. And then often the, the senior judge will... Um, let you try one case. So in, for me, I went out to, with Judge Marvel to San Francisco, and on the third day, she let me try a, a little debt equity case, and she sat behind me. So there were two judges <laughs> on the bench, and whenever I needed help, she'd come <laughs> lean over and whisper in my ear, don't do that, you know, whatever. Uh, and that's how we, how we learn. And I mean, different judges have more or less of that depending on their um, career backgrounds. If you've been litigating tax court cases for 30 years at a law firm, you know, one prep session like that may be enough. If you're coming from joint committee on taxation and never been in a courtroom, you know, you may have, you may want more than one or two, two of uh, these practice, trial, session, trial sessions. But, you know, I, I think the, we, we try and the chief judge tries to um, dole out the right amount of, of uh, training according to the needs of the, of the new judges. Explain the case assignment process. You've had a number <clears throat> of big cases, and I expect that's not a coincidence. Well, you know, many district courts, uh, cases are assigned rotationally. Like, case comes in, goes to Judge A. Next case goes to Judge B, and so, so on, around and around and around. We don't have that. The way most of our cases get a, assigned to us is sort of indirectly um, by virtue of being sent to conduct a trial session. So let's say we have a trial session in Minneapolis coming up in December. <clears throat> our docket section 
will put on all the cases where taxpayers have asked for Minneapolis as their you know, trial venue and just slot them in onto the calendar sheet until they get to about 120, 130, 140. And then they'll apply them to the next Minneapolis or St. Paul session. <clears throat> so the way you get cases is if I'm assigned to go to that trial session, those are my cases. So it's really just, again, pretty the luck of the draw. Now, <clears throat> and I would say that's how probably 90% or more of cases get assigned. They just are presented to you by virtue of your appearance uh, as a presiding judge in that court session. Now, there are cases that could become widowed for some reason, like a, a judge may um, be in ill health or retire or die, and then all his or her cases have got to be reassigned. And that's one way you can get cases um, from the chief judge. Also, and some of the, and these are more of the cases you're referring to, the parties may request early assignment to a judge. So before a case gets put onto a, a trial session, it's in what we call the general docket, which the, the chief judge supervises. He has a staff of lawyers who handle all the incoming motions in the general docket. And in a, in a big case that's going to go to trial, that, where the parties expect a lot of pretrial activity, like you know, motions in limine and uh, discovery disputes and protective orders and all that, they will often prefer to have the judge who's going to try the case handle the, the pretrial motions so the judge gets familiar with the facts and knows that you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time they file something. Uh, so they'd rather have the judge who's going to try the case rather than some staff lawyer in the front office handle these things. And that's how I got both the Amazon case and I believe the Coca-Cola case. The, the, the parties requested early assignment to a judge. The chief judge put the cases out for volunteers and I volunteered and um, you raised your hand. I raised my hand, right. You know, part of it is um, the kind of cases you like. I, I like big, complicated cases where um, you know, economics are, I mean, what's really going on economically and stuff is important. And those cases often tend to be, um, involve multi-week trials, huge records of testimony, lots of expert reports, thousands or tens of thousands of documents, and a lot of procedural, you know, <clears throat> mishigas up front. I mean, I would say a case like Amazon, Coca-Cola, Facebook, which Judge Pugh has, a case like that occupies as much time in my chambers as 50 small cases. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. So some judges just don't want cases that are going to take up that much time, be that complicated, and just be a drag on their productivity for, for years. Um, I kind of like the, the big cases, so I volunteered for a lot of them. <laughs> I'm going to ask you some other questions about your case management in, in just mm -hmm. a second, but let me ask you about the court's case management. Does the chief judge or a court administrator uh, monitor the ca caseload and uh, the age of the cases in inventory? Are you, are you measured against some standard? <clears throat> well, the most um, obvious kind of standard is what we call our quarterly reports. So every, in, a, in every calendar quarter, each chamber must submit to the chief judge a report of all their cases in their inventory and the status of those cases. And <clears throat> the first pay, the first form of that report is called the one-year list. And these are cases that are more than one year old uh, without having an opinion be produced yet. And that all the judges receive a copy of that form. So you, you know when, when, when your colleagues are, have gotten way behind. And you know, when I've, well, I've been on the court now for eight plus years, you know, some judges routinely have no cases on the one-year list. Some have had as many as 20, 25, or 30 on the one-year list. Some of them as much as six or seven years old, which is, you know, bad for a lot of reasons. I mean, the parties don't receive justice. 
you have a, one law clerk draft the opinion, he, he, he or she leaves, and a new law clerk comes in, has to reinvent the wheel, and, then, and you forget what was in the case was about, and there are all kinds of inefficiencies that creep in when cases get really, really old. So the one thing the chief judge definitely does, if a judge is getting behind, the chief judge has discretion to assign that judge no more trial sessions until the judge climbs out of the hole. So that means you just don't go out on trial. You spend your time in D.C., in your chambers, uh, working on opinions to get caught up. And that, I think the chief judges have been quite good in using that uh, authority to, to try and get judges to be more current. Apart from that, um, there's, really no, there's really no disciplinary tool available. It is partly shaming people and partly um, <clears throat> denying them the fun of traveling to L.A. for you know, a trial session uh, to get them to, to work. And I, I think the, 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 the other thing that happens is you know, the, the private parties can get annoyed <clears throat> if they've waited six years. What can they do? Can they do anything? The best thing they can do would be to to, <laughs> to uh, <clears throat> contact their congressman if they have a good relationship, and have Congress contact the chief judge of the tax court and express unhappiness, and that will tend to get results. We have to go to Congress for our budget request every year. We have to go to the Congress for legislative fixes for little technical problems in the code involving our court. And um, we never want Congress to be unhappy with our court. So if uh, that was what I, I would advise people if they, I mean, it, it does no good to call the judges and say, where the hell is the opinion? You know what I mean? That, it's not going to get you anywhere. <clears throat> but if pressure comes in to the chief judge from Congress, that, that, could, have, that could have an effect. <clears throat> Let me ask you about your chambers. So you, how many clock clerks do you have? How long a term do they serve? Where do you get them from? So we'll have JD and LLM students watching this. <clears throat> Talk about that. Well, I have two law clerks. Um, normally, when you turn 70, become a chief judge, you, you go down to one law clerk. Senior judge. See, senior judge. What did I say? Chief. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. <clears throat> senior judge. You go down to one law clerk to reflect what is usually a reduced workload. Uh, because my workload has not really reduced, uh, the chief judge allowed me to have two law clerks uh, for the next this cycle and the next cycle. So I always have two law clerks. I typically gotten most of them from the tax LM programs, but you know it's not. I mean, one of my current <coughs> clerks, Elizabeth, um, went to Yale and clerked on the First Circuit before coming to to clerk for me. So there are various uh, <coughs> paths. I also have two. Uh, judicial externs every semester, uh, typically from a, a, a DC, you know, <clears throat> law school, uh, who get academic credit for uh, for two credits for like working on stuff, and then they work with the law clerks under their supervision and produce copies. So every semester, I've got four people pretty much producing material for me, and during the summer, we often can get a paid intern who will work a forty-week session during the summer. So I have a a larger than normal staff, I would say. And that helps explain the productivity you mentioned earlier, I think. How do you run your chambers? I try to make the experience resemble what a young lawyer would find at a top law firm. I mean, some judges, I think, you know, view the law clerks mainly as opinion drafters and give them like a deadline for giving an opinion and then you provide that and you get another deadline for the next opinion. I try and get the, the clerks involved in every phase of what we do, you know, motions, non-routine motions anyway, discovery stuff, motions in limine, protective orders, so that their drafting is not just opinions. It's kind of the whole, you know, and frankly, you know, as a young associate, you're probably not drafting a whole lot of 30-page briefs. You're doing a lot of motions practice, so I think it's actually good for them to to he hear the conference calls where we're discussing discovery disputes and then draft 
orders, resolving discovery disputes. It's much more, you know, what life is going to be like at a law firm, and I think that's better training for the for my law clerks. On opinions, I for every case I try, I will do a, a written set of trial, what I call trial notes, between you know three pages and twelve pages, depending on the number of issues. After the trial, either like in a hotel room that night or on the plane on the way back, <clears throat> and that memorializes my view of how the case probably ought to come out based on what I know at the end of the trial, mainly the factual stuff. Uh, the post-trial briefs will come in later, and that may you know, refine everybody's thinking about the, the, the law, but I pretty much know what I think the facts are. If the lawyers have been good about pointing me to the salient documents and the record and so forth. And so, you know, well, I find that that's a very helpful thing to have because the briefs often don't come in until, you know, four, five, six months. At that point, you know, who remembers what the case is about? So I have my contemporaneous trial notes that I can review and the law clerk can look at when beginning to draft the opinion. So you have my trial notes and you have the briefs and you kind of compare them. And that kind of gives them a roadmap of how to draft the opinion. I think it makes the process much more efficient. When I then get a draft, I'll review my trial notes, make sure to see if there's, you know, similarity between the two. And it enables me to get the draft review and out to the chief judge um, much more quickly. Some judges, I think, and this is equally defensible, want to get a completely unvarnished objective view from the law clerk about how the case should be decided. And so they don't tell them how they're leaning. <clears throat> I think that can cause problems. I think it causes people to dive down rabbit holes that maybe just wastes time. And I think it, it, it puts pressure on the law clerk to try and figure out read the judge's mind, like, well, okay, he didn't tell me, but well, what, what does he probably want to do? And I, I just don't want to put someone in that. I think it's an awkward position to be in. No, no, I, I write trial notes, and the, if the worker tells me, no, I'm sorry, the cases are against you, fine, you know, we'll flip it around. But I do think it's good to have a starting point against which the trial clerk, the law clerk can assess the, the, the law as set forth in the briefs and in the cases. And then, you know, I'm perfectly willing to change my mind if I'm if I'm wrong. You, you, you anticipated a, a question I was going to ask, but let me ask it <clears throat> more full, fully. So, you know, it's typical in criminal trials and many civil trials. The evidence is put on, the jury deliberates, and comes back within a few hours or a few days with a verdict, while all the evidence, all the witness demeanor things are still fresh in the mind. It's typical in a large tax court case, as you said, the trial concludes, the parties go away, they work on post-trial briefs, which are often lengthy, they get them to the judge six months later, and then some period of months or even years later, the, the tax court issues his or her opinion, which raises the question, how much does the dynamic at trial actually play into the result? Or at the end of the day, is it really just a, a decision based on the trial record, which obviously puts a premium on the record, rather than on charisma or, mm -hmm. or demeanor or any of the trial dynamics that you know, people think drive criminal and civil trial verdicts? Well, I think the trial, <clears throat> it, it varied by the type of case. You know, in a, um, in a big, like, transfer pricing case, rarely, if ever, do you have its witness credibility, you know, an issue so you have to worry about. So to that extent, you know, the, in a way, the, the trial transcript tells you the same thing that sitting through the trial would tell you. But, you know, there are moments in trials when, when um, things become, little epiphanies kind of occur, that you, if you weren't there in person, you might not be struck by the importance of an admission made or a document. And if you're, you know, you're just after the fact reading a 4,000-page transcript, you know, you might miss that, that kind of thing. Uh, but I think you're, you're basically right. From, for for, for the, the big, complicated cases, the, I mean, I'll, I'll have memories, you know, from the trial that I will memorialize in my trial notes, that, you know, things I thought were really important. And then, you know, the, the, the law clerk and I can then reassess that in light of the the briefs that, 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 that come in. Now, in pro se cases, 
you know, when it's questions about substantiating deductions and things like that, I mean, credibility, you know, becomes a lot more important. Like, you know, is this person a real estate professional? Did they spend, what, 400 hours working on the real estate? Well, you know, typically they didn't keep very good contemporaneous logs and they're testifying about all the snow they shoveled. You know, I mean, they're, they're your, your contemporaneous understanding of what's happening, I think, is much more important. And the trial really is important. So we, we, at the top of this podcast, we displayed some statistics about how productive your chambers is. What accounts for that? <clears throat> well, one reason, as I said a moment ago, is I have a, big, a, big, a bigger than average staff. I've got two clerks, two externs every semester. And they just produce more copy. Um, I tend not, I mean, I've, I've been writing stuff my whole life. You know, I was writing opinions for uh, on courts when I was a law clerk, opinion letters at Kaplan and Drysdale, briefs when I was in the SG's office. So I don't have a whole lot of writer's cramp, I guess. I feel pretty confident. Once I've, once I've determined what the right answer is and the right analysis is, I feel very confident in being able to get that written up um, w without going through seven drafts. You know, pretty much I get a draft my law clerk. We read the briefs, make, edit. I edit a lot. I mean, I, I, I change most paragraphs. I reorganize things, and uh, I'm a pretty heavy um, editor. Um, but when, pretty much when I've done that and sent it back to the clerk with, you know, I'll leave brackets. You know, can we say this? Uh, a find better site for this. And I'll leave little instructions embedded in the text for the, for the clerk, and the clerk will do that, send it back to me. I'll reread it, and if it sounds good, off it goes to the chief judge. So we can turn around a 10-page opinion in a couple of days when, once I get the draft. 40-page opinions tend to take a little longer. Uh, so that's part of it. And the, the other re reason for the productivity, I think, is my style about when I write opinions. Um, a number of my colleagues will be inclined to dispose of a summary judgment motion, even when it granting it ends the case by order rather than by opinion, which which you know is perfectly um, you know uh, appropriate. Um, and th th so if you just do it by order, it doesn't get picked up in the, you know, opinion uh, <clears throat> calculator. My view has always been that if we're, if I'm drafting a piece of paper that's going to end the case for the, the party, th I think they're kind of owed an opinion. Uh, usually be a memorandum opinion, you know, it may be a summary opinion if it's, you know, a small tax case. But uh, I generally tend to write uh, opinions. Uh, and in, even in fairly routine, like collection due process cases that tend to be somewhat formulaic, uh, uh, many judges will do those by order, and I usually tend to write an opinion. So that, that's pumped up my number of opinions a bit. Some of your opinions, like those of other judges, uh, are long, particularly in the transfer pricing space. It's typical, it's, or at least not uncommon, to find transfer pricing opinions that are 40 to 50,000 words. Now, for perspective, Brown versus Board of Education, including footnotes, was 3,800 words. So these, which was a lot more consequential case than a transfer pricing case. But the transfer pricing case are 10 times, more than 10 times <coughs> the length. Do they have to be so long? And, and who are you writing for? Are you writing for the litigants or the Court of Appeals? Both. But I think mainly for the Court of Appeals. I mean, transfer pricing often is extremely <clears throat> fact-intensive. And the thing, that the, 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 what gets <clears throat> deference in appellate review are your findings of fact. So as you know, our opinions are broken into findings of fact and opinion. And you, you, you want to get clearly erroneous review for the, the stuff is in your findings of fact. And the findings of fact need to be comprehensive. And you know, then you're also you're going to be using your findings of fact again in the discussion section, in the opinion section, in making advancing your legal <clears throat> legal arguments. So you want to make sure the facts are you know, the way you want them when you use them later in the in the in the discussion. 
So yeah, I think an Amazon Coca-Cola statement of facts was 80, 90 pages in both. Uh, you know, but you're, in each case, I had a seven or eight week trial, eight to 10 hours a day. I had you know, 20, 30 expert witnesses who filed opening reports and rebuttal reports and testified. You know, tens of thousands of documents. And there's just a lot, there are a lot of facts that need to be covered. And if you don't put them in there, you don't get the deferential review when the case goes up on the, um, to the Court of Appeals. Now, I think you'll, you, you, you'll agree that Supreme Court opinions in general have gotten a lot longer than they used to be. If you go back to the 1920s, or the three, four, Holmes wrote two, two, two page opinions, right? And they've generally gotten longer, probably because there are so many law clerks who have nothing else to do except write long opinions. Uh, but I think in transfer pricing particularly, it's not really just that the, the job has expanded to fill the number of people available to do the, to the drafting. I only had one law clerk you know, work on, on uh, for the most part, on those two, two, ca two big cases. It's just that the, when you have a really important case that's kind of a bet the company case for the taxpayer and litigation priority for the IRS, they each have teams of 20, 20 lawyers, they make a lot of arguments. You know, they just make a lot of arguments and sub-arguments and alternative arguments and second alternative arguments. And uh, you got to redress all of them. Because, you know, one way to get reversed is not to address an argument. And they go, people say, he didn't even look at this argument. He didn't even mention it. He remand, you know. So I think it is, I, mean, I try and keep my opinions as short as I can. And, and what I often do, what I do when I go through the editing process is take out words, take out sentences, take out paragraphs, take out footnotes where I can to kind of compress it. But, you know, I, 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 there were so many issues in, in, like in the Coca-Cola case that had to be decided and sub-issues and Amazon and the factual questions about the decay curve is for their software. I mean, it's with five experts testifying about that, you know, each having a 70-page report, it, 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 it's just a lot of stuff to cover. So you mentioned litigants make a lot of arguments. Let me ask you a question about that. Did you have experience in private practice where you would win on your second best argument and lose on what you thought would carry the day? And, and I, I think some litigants worry about presenting a lot of arguments or arguments in the alternative. On the one hand, they don't want to miss out on an opportunity. On the other hand, they don't want to seem mm -hmm. to lack confidence in their primary position. Do you have a view on that as a judge? Well, I think you find both. I think that's one attitude. The other attitude is um, you don't want to be the lawyer who took out the argument that might have won the case. And then you get egg on your face, right? So I think a lot of times when you have briefs written by committee, as often happens in these big cases, the senior partner says, well, put this argument in too. I think that's another instinct, just so you don't risk <clears throat> losing when you didn't have to. I, I think that the most effective way to handle that is, you know, is to make kind of your home run argument and then have your alternative be a less, a more modest argument, which also gets you most or all of what you want. And I think there's ne never any problem doing that. As long as your home run argument is you know, plausible and not, not goofy, uh, you make the, the big picture argument that really kind of resolves this question for all time. And then if, if the court's not going to go there, give them a secondary argument that, that, that um, takes care of this case, maybe a few other cases, and uh, uh, is maybe not quite as intellectually satisfying, but will do, do the, turn, the, turn the key for you. That's the most effective way. Um, I, th I think most lawyers, uh, I find, tend to make more arguments than they need to. I mean, p particularly if you're in a, if you're in an area of law that is um, under development, like I would say the conservation easement area right now, where there's a lot of litigation and probably will keep being a lot of litigation. Lawyers are just arguing everything, you know? Because you know the case could go up on appeal, and you never know what argument's gonna prevail ultimately. So I, I think when an area gets very highly litigated, lawyers tend to make kitchen sink type briefs, just throwing everything in. And that's a natural instinct, because you just there's uncertainty. You don't know what's gonna happen on appeal or go to the Supreme Court, and you don't wanna be the guy who didn't make the argument that turns out to be the winner eventually, you know? Is there any prejudice to doing that, though? I don't think so. I think courts understand what's going on. 
typically. Litigators sometimes worry that if the opposing counsel struggles, the judge may take, may step in to assist uh, and then get invested in the side that he or she's assisting. Did you encounter that as a litigator? And, and does it affect how you conduct yourself as a judge? Well, I do ask a lot of questions <clears throat> uh, from the bench, typically you know, at the end of the, a witness's testimony. But I've never felt that it's because the lawyer has somehow failed or come up short. It's just things that I would like to explore more. Uh, and, you know, I'm pretty even-handed, I think, and I'll ask questions. I'll ask each side what I think the tough questions are. And um, you know, some witnesses get to escape with no questions at all. Uh, other witnesses get I ask a lot of questions of, <clears throat> particularly you know, experts. You know, when expert does a report, you know, in, in any kind of complicated financial type question or transfer pricing or the expert's kind of building a model to produce a result and they're making all these assumptions and, you know, estimates and, and various stages of the analysis and depending on the soundness of those assumptions, you can come out with the answer of two or 200, you know what I mean? If, if, and if if there's a bias at each step, you get right. further and further and further away from the, the the mean. And I, you know, I study expert reports really, really thoroughly, and I will often quiz the experts. Okay, why did you assume that here? It seems a very assumption is very favorable to your client. Why did you make that assumption? And there's a lot of questions like that I'll ask. What's your attitude about expressing settlement views from the bench? I would never express a view using the word settlement. I mean, uh, uh, we're, ne we're never supposed to be aware of settlement discussions the parties may have had earlier, and often they have. You know, if they've gone to IRS appeals, they will have had so And I always have to shut that down. If, if often the taxpayer will want to tell me what he got offered by the appeals officer, and I, no, no, I, don't wanna, I can't hear that. So I, I keep settlement out of the uh, discussion altogether. Um, I will sometimes in a conference call before a trial session, if I sense the one party is being intransigent, I'm, I may say, well, you know, you got to think about this, right? And try and give them a little nudge. Mm -hmm. it, it, not that I'm proposing any particular settlement, but I'm trying to get, get both sides to be reasonable and understand that they have hazards of litigation. So that's kind of a soft um, sort of push toward Settlement, different judges use, some judges are much more aggressive in pushing towards settlement. I'm probably in the middle. Um, at the end of a trial, and this isn't really about settlement, but I, I often give quite expansive discussion of what I would like to see in the post-trial briefs. And the particular issues that I think are really important, I want them to be addressed, and the particular problems with the, you know, the evidence. Uh, I will point, point that out. So I, I do like to give a lot of direction. Now, this may occasionally prompt a settlement, but the, the main thing is to get briefs that are as responsive as possible to what I think is important. So the experience of having a judge ask the litigants, what is this case doing in my court, is not, is not <laughs> an experience that you provide to no, litigants. No. I mean, there, there are some judges who... Um, well, essentially, you know, if it's a if it's a pure substantiation case, all, the only question is, you know, can the taxpayer verify their car and truck expenses and their supplies expenses on Schedule C? I mean, many judges say, look, I'm not going to try this case. It's ridiculous. Either you got the substantiation or you don't. And if you don't, you're going to lose. And you're going to lose whether you're before me or whether you're before the IRS. So you work this out. And again, the, there are degrees of... Um, severity of that approach. Right. Uh, I will never say once we're in court, right. this case should not be in my courtroom. A charge is commonly made that people change after years on the bench. They become more comfortable with their authority, <laughs> less modest about their role. Uh, have, have, have you seen that in judges, and do you see that in yourself? Well, 
I don't, I hope that's not true of me. Um, I think I, I still take, I mean, I, I've learned more tax now than I knew when I started being a judge. When I started being a judge, I never handled a collection due process case or an innocent spouse case or a lot of the kind of procedural type things. And then I, now I, I know a lot about that. So in a way, I feel somewhat more confident, less at sea, if you will, than I did the day I joined the, the court. But I don't think it's made me overconfident. I hope it hasn't made me overconfident. Um, I think what happens to some judges after you've been on the court 15, 20 years, you know, the, the, the novelty of writing opinions, communicating wisdom to the world becomes a little less appealing maybe. And I've only been on there eight years. I have not yet lost the kind of the freshness and enthusiasm for drafting and really writing and really explaining stuff. You know, the alternative you can do is just write a bench opinion read a bench opinion, in, in the, and then you're done, you know. No briefs, no research, no drafts from the law clerk, no going to chief judge for review, no going to the court reporter, just you're done. And I think, you know, um, one way of, if, of controlling your workload is to do, you know, a lot of bench opinions and, and you don't have as much to do. I still like writing the, the official opinions. You know, as, we both know from our days at our law firm that the rule was you have to have two pair of eyes and everything that goes out of the office. And um, I like having the chief judge and his staff look at my work. I like having the reporter correct all my <laughs> typos and you know citation errors so that what goes out to the public is you know is as good as it can be, really. And I haven't lost enthusiasm for that yet. Maybe I will at some point. <laughs> so. A, a word more on your senior status. You, you took senior status when you turned 70 in January 2020. You said normally uh, the consequence is that you lose one of your clerks, but you are f as active and as productive as before. What does, in practical terms, what does it mean to you? To be a senior judge? Yes. Well, the only, the only literal difference is you can no longer vote in court conference. So court conferences are kind of on banc type procedure where the chief judge will refer a, a we call them reports, draft opinion by a judge to all the judges to um, reconsider. And this will be true, for example, if the judge, the authoring judge, uh, proposed to invalidate a treasury regulation to overrule a prior tax court opinion, uh, if the authoring judge disagrees with a another circuit to which appeal does not lie, there's a kind of automatic cases that go to court conference. And the case goes to court conference, the only people who are allowed to vote, yay or nay, would be the, the regular judges, non-senior judges. And if the author is a senior judge, he or she also gets to vote. Otherwise, you lose your vote. And you still can participate. You can go to the court conference and you can write memos. And you can try and persuade people to the right answer. But when it comes to the vote of which is going to prevail, yes or no, on this report, you don't get to vote. And, um, you know, that's kind of annoying. It, it, it seems awfully arbitrary that because you turn 70, you're still working full tilt. You lose your vote. In, and in, in a way, you know, you'd like to think that the more senior judges who've been at this for a, lo a longer time have a lot of experience and wisdom and knowledge of tax law, and they don't get to vote, but a judge who just got confirmed yesterday does. And, you know, it, it seems a little odd, but that's how the revenue code is, has structured our, <laughs> our existence. Uh, you know, once you turn senior judge, you, 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 you're recalled back into active service by the chief judge, and you pretty much have to work one third time or be, or more. Um, most judges who, who are in that position have already um, served 10 years and they are fully vested in their pension. So they're kind of working for free because they could just retire and collect. The, you, your pension is your, fi is your final salary, right? So you could just quit and have the same compensation. So they were kind of working for free, uh, senior judge. But I've, I've only been at it eight and a half years now and I kind of feel at least morally obligated to kind of work at full tilt until I 
had my 10 years of besting. Has, has the COVID situation affected the court? Do you expect it will affect how you handle cases going forward post-COVID? <clears throat> it has had a big effect on the court. <clears throat> and uh, for a while, the building was shut down completely. Uh, then judges were allowed to come in, uh, but no other staff. And now, gradually with vaccinations, um, chamber staff can be in the, in the chambers with the judge without masks, but we have to wear masks in any public part of the building. The building, I think, is still not open to the public, and we've had no public trials since March a year ago. Um, all our trials have been on, done remotely by ZoomGov, it's kind of a more secure version of, of Zoom that everybody else has been doing for you know, birthday parties and <laughs> family gatherings. So, uh, and that's been pretty, pretty good. I mean, for most, I've, I've found the lawyers are pretty good at bringing up, docu sharing documents on, on Zoom and you know, drawing witnesses' attention to the documents. And most of them have worked fairly smoothly. It's, it's kind of hard to do a really huge case that way, but one, two hour trials are, are not that difficult. Um, and you know, in, in, way, in a way, it has facilitated some things. I, I had a case a few months ago involving a taxpayer who was residing in Kandahar, Afghanistan, working as a de civilian defense contractor and uh, involved the question of foreign earned income exclusion. And we had the trial remotely. She testified from Kandahar on her computer. There were, I think, six other witnesses, two of whom were at Kandahar. One was in North Carolina, one was in Florida, one was in Texas, and the lawyers were in Atlanta. I was in Washington. I don't know where the court reporter and my trial clerk were. And you know, this would have been virtually impossible to do uh, in, real, in, in person. So the cases like that that, that, that are really facilitated by Zoom. And the more routine cases, I think, where, you know, we, we go to Texas, like Houston is a trial session there. If you live out in the Panhandle and Houston is your place of trial, you got, you know, a two and a half hour drive each direction for what might be a, a one hour trial, the case might settle, you know. And there's a lot of transaction costs for, for pro se taxpayers in these relatively smaller dollar cases that I think can be handled efficiently uh, by remote proceedings. So we're still working through this, but I think a number of judges think it would be good to preserve some form of remote proceeding, how it would work out, whether it would be elective or that both parties would have to agree. And there are many things to be decided, but I, my expectation is it's not going to go away completely with the end of COVID. Finally, what advice do you have for JD or LLM students or young lawyers starting out? What advice did you receive that you found valuable and offered to your clerks or to others? Well, my advice is, is conditioned in part by what I, I explained to you about how I got the jobs that I've had, which were all just acts of God, pretty much. And I think it's a mistake to try and plan you know, where you want to be in 20 years and then to try and chart a path to get there and what jobs you need to have and who you have to, you know, please and all the rest of it. Because it, life is just too unpredictable. My advice would be just to, to take advantage of the best opportunity that is presented to you at any point in time and do your, your best possible job at that. And that will lead to something else. You don't know what it's going to lead to but it'll be something probably better and higher up the food chain. And it, it's a mistake to uh, hold out for the perfect job and uh, disdain jobs you think are not quite good enough for you. Uh, the best thing you can do is do a good job, get good recommendations, people like you, rave about you, and th that will lead open more doors, and you just keep doing that. And you may end up, who knows where, in, in Arctica perhaps, but you, 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 you will, the only way to make progress I think, is to continue to do a, perform well. And, and that will be, that will be uh, appreciated and uh, acknowledged and lead to more opportunities. Well, if I've 
followed correctly, one of the striking things in your experience, and this experience I know is shared by others, is that most of your opportunities came from basically your peers, not from a senior partner who looks down 20 or 30 years more junior and says that kid has the stuff, but people who are a year ahead of you in law school or with whom you worked as a peer who are in positions to recommend mm -hmm. you. That has been my experience. I think it's different for different in different <clears throat> parts of our economy. You know, if you are a uh, a Senate staffer and you have a powerful senator that likes you, there are positions that will open up to you, whether on courts or elsewhere. Um, and I think the same may be true maybe in smaller communities where there's a really powerful law firm and the senior partner knows everybody in the state and can. So there are certainly cases where, where if you have a, a particular senior mentor who has a lot of clout in some sector of the government or the economy, that can be a big help. Uh, I personally didn't benefit from that really, uh, I don't think. It's mostly people who were roughly my my peers who, who uh, knew of my interests uh, and abilities. But I think, you know, just sucking up to the, the, the top people is, is not how I would recommend you get ahead in life. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, you put it in such an uncharitable way. Of course, you want to do good work for right. other people. But I, I think one of the lessons is to be respectful of your peers, mm -hmm. to be helpful to your peers, to be known as someone they respect and like working with. Yeah, and a team player, right. A team player. I think that's true. I think it definitely is true. And your subordinates as well, you know. They, t they talk. I guess themselves. the conclusion is we have to be nice to everybody. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, it's not a bad prescription for, for life, to be nice to everybody. Yeah. Well, Judge, thank you so much for being our guest. Um, we'll leave it there. I want to thank Judge Lauber uh, for being the guest on this podcast. Uh, this is Matt Frank. Until next time, thank you for listening. <laughs>